Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Liz, for inviting me. And thank you all for coming today. I'm really pleased to be here to talk about these things. I, I have to say, I do. I feel like I kept wanting to answer the questions that were being asked, and I thought, no, no, this is it's, this is why we we have an order, we have a setup, and I, I will address some of the things that were just asked as I talk, because I think there's a lot of intersection with what we're doing. Um, so I'm going to talk about opportunities and obstacles, um, big data, data sharing, and the future of social science, which I, I, uh, I love topics like this, because I can talk about whatever I want, <laughs> um, or things I'm thinking about all the time. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges and the opportunities associated with big data. Um, so there are lots and lots of opportunities. You've got, an, you've got amazing pictures of the opportunities um, in Atul's talk. Um, I, I'm actually not a health person. I'm an economist. Um, and so I, I tend to think about these things in terms of what you would do to measure economic activity. But the, but the, the challenges and the benefits, the opportunities are very similar. So what are the opportunities? Well, you have, as we just heard, much more granular data, right? We know about which teacher in which school, in which school district, in which state, right? We know about, so it's much more granular data. We know about the individuals, we know about the transactions, we know about the locations. We can see these things embedded in networks. Was there one teacher trained or a bunch of teachers trained? You can see all of that at, um, when you're working with big data. It's often much more timely, right? You get heart rate. If you have a, if you have a Fitbit, you can get and you use that data. You get streaming data that is gives you heart rates, um, you know, all, I don't know how often they take your heart rate on a, on a Fitbit, but more frequently than I go to the doctor, right? So you get more, <laughs> right? So, uh, so more frequently. The, this data is also digital trace data. All of this is created automatically. So it takes, it's less of an imposition on a subject who might have to enter a survey or participate in an experiment. If these things are created actually in the process of our daily living because we are walking or because we are playing on our computer or we're, we're doing or going to the doctor just for our normal things all of these things are there and the and the data is available for research at much lower cost in principle right cost to the research community and cost to the individual there are also, as we have heard, some very big challenges with working with this data. And the very first one that comes up, it came up um, actually in our discussion before um, the session started, has to do with consent and privacy. And so that's privacy of the individuals who are being studied. It also has to do with the private ownership of the data, the, how PIs think about this and how companies like Epic think about this. Um, there was a wonderful, very interesting, provocative op-ed in the New York Times last week encouraging basically a weakening of HIPAA in order to encourage using data, um, electronic health care record data for research. Um, but it talked about how companies intentionally make their um, their electronic health record systems interoperable. And that's something that I actually I do know about because I study competition and barriers to entry. And obviously, private businesses that are building these things have an interest in keeping them not interoperable, not fair. And that creates um, tensions for the research and public health and prevention objectives. So those are a set of challenges that come with using these data. The other challenge, which is very real, is that big data is big, right? And we sort of thought we had conquered this, right? My gosh, your computer on your desktop, your laptop, you know, sitting there on your lap can do more than you could imagine, and this data overwhelms it, right? So we have to think about moving to the cloud, which then raises other security concerns that, right? It, we have to think about learning new technologies, new approaches, new methods. A lot of people who are trying to work with this data feel obliged to work and, and, and might, they benefit collab from collaborations with computer scientists because we don't have the tools to manage this data, to make it useful, to understand what is 
junk because there's, you know, if you're looking at something that happens randomly once in a hundred times or once in a thousand times, it's going to happen many, many, many times when you're talking about data at this scale. So our notions of statistical significance have to change. All of these things are, are challenges in terms of our developing our skills and our tools to study the things that we all want to study using these data. The other part of my charge for today was to talk about data sharing. Ah, and there are enormous opportunities and challenges associated with data sharing. Some of these things I'm going to do are going to echo the things that Mike just said, right? We invest billions of dollars every year in collecting scientific data, right? And when we share that data, we leverage that investment for further research, for further knowledge building. If we create all of that data and it is only available for one study or one research team or the people, that research team and their students and their buddies, then we get less out of it as a society, as, a, as a, we get less scientific knowledge and it is also more likely to be, to follow a certain path, right? So, so we leverage that investment in data collection when we share. We also increase transparency and reproducibility of research, right? And why is this important? Well, it's important for a number of reasons, but I want to emphasize one right now, which is that it increases the trust, the legitimacy of scientific research. And I think we all know that we are in a period in which there is a lack of trust in scientific research. That's true in some things because, of poli because they're politically charged, but it's also true in some things because people hear one day that Carbs are good for you and carbs are bad for you. I was listening to the comic who did Kathy on the, on the radio the other day and she was talking about trying to decide whether she could eat something because of, of all the conflicting advice. And there are, I would say most of the population feels like there is no consistency in the advice that we give and we can create more confidence that there, that there is actually a scientific underpinning to what we are building and that we are building on previous knowledge when we are transparent in what we do. And finally, and perhaps most fundamentally, this actually goes back, I think, to Thomas Kuhn, that we have, we sh when we share data, we facilitate knowledge building. Science is inherently incremental. That doesn't mean it's not transformative. That doesn't mean it can't be radical. But it builds on what we knew before. Its job is to explain new evidence and old evidence right, with a bigger picture. And if you can't see the old evidence, you actually can't do that. So we need to be able to share our data in order to build on prior research, in order to facilitate to actually have the advancement of science, okay? So data sharing is important. Actually, I was on, on one of the National Academies panels I happen to be on right now. We went around the room and everyone talked about their biases and everyone said, oh, well, I am biased in front of, in favor of data access. It's like, well, okay, so that's, that sounds like an, an apple pie, right? Um, so, so we can believe in this, but there are also some really big challenges, right? And the first is that it's hard, right? It takes real resources. Again, Mike was saying part of the reason NLM and NI are emphasizing is this is that they want to say they are willing to put their resources into data sharing because it takes resources just taking what you did and sticking it up on the website without thinking about whether it's meaningful to somebody else is not really sharing your data it is a checkbox but it doesn't make your data fair right findable accessible interoperable reusable again i'm really, really glad to see mike raise this this is when we when we want to when we say that we're sharing data we're sharing it for something right we're making it available to people they can find it they can discover it it's not hidden away someplace there is actually a process for them to get to it. That's what we mean by access. It doesn't mean it's just necessarily stuck up on a website, but it is possible to get there. It is interoperable. That is a really big challenge. It is reusable. At least I can figure out what's in these data. Okay, this, it, this requires, this is actually more challenging than making 
articles open, right? If you publish an article, it's designed for other people to read, mostly, right? <laughs> um, and maybe the publisher puts up a paywall and you can say, oh, make it open, we take down the paywall. Making data accessible, making it fair, making it sharing data requires more than just taking down a paywall. We actually have to invest in making it readable, right? And making it useful, like you are supposed to do with your articles too, right? <laughs> um, it also does require, and I'm going to talk more about this, protecting private interests. And by private, and we're going to, and I'm using private now in several very, very different ways. And I've only just been thinking in my own head about how different we, the, what we mean when we say private is and how this creates confusion in some conversations. So sometimes we mean we want to protect the privacy of subjects, right? Participants who are, whose experiences are being measured. And we might do that by blurring things as our tool did in his graph, right? We also might want to protect the private interests of PIs because PIs do have careers and they invest a lot in creating data resources and we need to make sure that there are incentives for them to do that data creation that are consistent with this being open, you know, knowledge building science, right? It's not actually knowledge building science if they do all the research and it stays in their drawer, right? Um, so we need to figure out how to incentivize researchers to create data but also to share data. And then finally there are data owners who might be the PIs but they might also be the, the health system, the um, well, I'm going to talk about social media. There are lots and lots of data, that are the, are the insurance company, there are lots and lots of data owners who are not researchers at all. And increasingly, they are trying to monetize the value of the information that is in their data. And that creates tensions with researchers. OK. So we have t-shirts now at ICPSR that say, sharing is caring. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, and so this is sort of the, 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 th the, um, the punch lines, I guess, to my talk, because I never get done, uh, is if no one else can access the data, right, it's not science, right? It's just, it's not, it's something, it's interesting. It's like if I do a crossword puzzle, that's fun and interesting to me, but it's not science because it's not something anyone else can interrogate. Okay? So we, so this is, this is critical. All right, secondly, we, have to do that in a way that is consistent with protecting privacy, right? And private property as appropriate, <laughs> um, right? But protecting privacy is critically important. I actually, this was the question that was asked. How do we share data if I'm actually collect, my data is about people's mental health? Um, so one of the things some of you may have seen is that recently the, um, the Environmental Protection Agency said, we are only going to accept as scientific research that we are going to use for decision making as evidence at the EPA is, um, is studies in which the data were open. And, um, and, and there was a lot of outcry about whether that meant that they were going to disregard a lot of very important scientific research that uses data which is not open. And then the, office, the, um, the chief statistician of the United States, who sits in the Office of Management and Budget in the White House, explained, <laughs> perhaps to the EPA, but certainly to the research community, that what it means for things to be open does not mean that anybody can get them and download them from a website. What that needs to mean when there are issues of privacy or in some cases of a company's um, intellectual property, their, their information about where they're drilling for oil or whatever they did, I don't know. Right? But, um, but what it means is that it's accessible, that it's transparent, that there are other people can get to it through transparent procedures. And I'm going to talk some about the kinds of, of procedures that we have developed in the past and that we are developing going forward to make sure that it's possible for people to, for there to be transparent access to confidential data, right? So third, so we share the data, we protect privacy, and then we also remember, and I think this is really important, that research subjects, right, and most of the general public, in fact, wants to 
contribute to scientific progress. I think that there is this, um, when we start to talk about privacy, again, we, we sometimes conflate the privacy of the subjects of the study and the private interests of the PI. When people choose, when they say, I will be in your experiment, I will be in your study, they're doing that and because, in fact, they want science to advance. They want us to learn about how to promote health. And we owe it to them to do the most that we can with the data about their lives and their bodies that they are sharing with us. Not just to lock it up, to protect their privacy, but also to protect their interests in improving health. So regulations can protect from harm and profiteering while still allowing scientific progress. I don't know how many of you have been listening to the kind of the stories that have been coming out about the reinterpretation of the Milgram experiments that were done at Stanford about whether people would shock other people um, and whether this meant that we were all sort of, you know, you know, willing to accept authoritarianism, which I, I which we will all decide right now we are not. Um, and so the first thing is we're having these discussions years later because in fact someone preserved and has been made, ex that, that data is, is accessible. And so we can go back and reevaluate it and rethink what it is we should learn from it. And one of the things that we've learned is that people, to the extent that they went along with this, they did this because, they did this when it was articulated to them that it was extremely valuable for the progress of science, for them to do something which was painful to themselves and to someone else. Now, I'm not saying that means people should shock other people, but I'm saying people are actually, they're willing to make sacrifices if we are actually doing this in the public interest, in the interest of public health, in the interest of scientific progress. Um, and we shouldn't be afraid to make that um, value statement, that, that, that demand. Okay, so what is to be done? So we need rules and we need tools. <laughs> um, one of the things I, um, I want to say is that standards are more effective than mandates in part and um and this is is part when, when we have standards that is to say we have well understood and shared best practices for how we manage data, for how we organize our data. It actually lowers the cost to researchers of doing this. I was, while Atul was talking, I was, um, I was actually texting my daughter who works for the Mount Sinai Health System and some friends who work in, uh, in IT at the University of Michigan and saying, how many of you use Epic, right? And again, so, right, sort of how standardized is this? Where is this standardized small institution? institutions don't use it. Having standards like that makes it possible to have interoperable data. It lowers the costs to the doctors and to the researchers to doing this. It increases the cost to the hospital system, so small hospitals don't use this. We have to figure out how to do that, right? It also helps to create new norms, and I think oftentimes people think about these as juxtapositions. Oh, either we have mandates or we have a shared understanding. It's about cultural change. No, it's about a rule. No, it's about technology. And the truth is, if we do these things well, they reinforce one another, right? So standards also make it easier to design tools. So again, Atul was talking about how we don't have apps that make use of this data, which has all been standardized. But once it's standardized, it's possible to design tools. That, and in his, he was talking about tools for patients or the general public to use. It also makes, um, it's all makes it possible for us to design tools that do things like what Mike was talking about, like curation at scale, is easier to do if, in fact, all of the geospatial data is in the same kind of format, if, in fact, all of the streaming data is in the same kind of format. When you standardize, of course, you get less innovation. If everybody uses Epic, we don't have the, the new thing. We don't have, I mean, having diversity is what allows new ideas and allows some competition. So there are trade-offs here. Right now, we have so much new data that at least from the point of view of the researcher community, a little bit of standardization will help. In the longer run, I think what Mike said is absolutely right, is that we are going to turn to, um, to data science and to machine learning to help us to provide, to create standards um, from, the, from what we see in the data itself, right? By, um, but th there's a, um, there are trade-offs there, okay. 
So now I'm going to turn to talking a little bit about what ICPSR is doing. Um, so first of all, I'm going to tell you what uh, a little bit about what ICPSR is, because not all of you may know. Um, uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm going to tell, and I'm going to focus on three new initiatives that we have: the linkage library, the um, the social media um, archive, and the researcher passport. So ICPSR is a data archive and a data community. It was founded in 1962 by 22 universities. We are now a consortium of 800 institutions worldwide. So probably almost everyone in this room is actually affiliated with an, an organization that is a member of ICPSR. We have about 10,000 studies, um, a quarter million files, 1,500 of them are restricted studies, which means that we, we restrict access in order to pr um, protect confidentiality. We have a data-related bibliography so that for every one of our studies, we keep track of articles or as, as much as we can, again, using some machine learning to keep track of um, articles that use the data and then we make the articles that use that data part of the metadata of the study so that there's a mapping from the data and the research products of the data. We have a bunch of thematic um, data collections and we have a summer program that some of you probably have attended. About a thousand students come to Ann Arbor every summer to learn uh, research methods. Um, what are we doing? So we, we make data sharing feasible. So when, I, by, by allowing anyone to deposit data um, and we curate it and we preserve it. So when someone says we have data on you know thousands of teachers um, and we've trained them and we have something about outcomes and I'm like, oh, okay, we'll follow up. We know where to, we can help you with that, right? Um, we also provide guidance to researchers over the data life cycle so that you can, when you write a consent statement for participants, you do so in a way that is consistent with data sharing, right? So we, data management plans, con again, consistent with transparency and, and reproducible access. We also do a lot to work to incentivize data sharing by providing things like a standard data, data standard citation of every data set that comes to ICPSR. It sounds like not earth shattering, but obviously if you're going to the effort to share your data, you want to make sure that anybody uses it, cites it properly so that you get credit. That actually also facilitates the creation of our bibliography. You can see who's using your data, how they're publishing it. Um, researchers use the bibliographies as well to find data resources of interest to them. We also have usage statistics, any data set at ICPSR. You can see how many times it's been downloaded every month forever. There are a number of challenges. I'm going to talk about some of, as I said, about three projects that we have going on right now that are addressing different aspects of um, what we think are really important challenges to big data when we want to encourage transparency, when we want to encourage data sharing. One of them is that oftentimes people now are working on projects where they are linking data, bringing data together um, at, the, at the record level, at the individual level. So we talked about identifiable data, in, in linking people, linking businesses, linking organizations, sometimes linking at geography. This raises lots of questions about keeping track of provenance because you've got your an, your analytical data set has data set from data from lots of different places it also makes it easier to re-identify because you've combined different things finally and this is really important i think a lot of people don't think about this when you link data sets when you link different data sets the, the intersection of the two may introduce differences in the study population and who's actually being studied that are often not very well documented or even necessarily thought through. We have created Linkage Library as a way to try to address some of these, um, these concerns. So Linkage Library is a repository that is for the data record linkage community. Um, it's to enable researchers to share linked data and linkage strategies so you can contribute data sets that you've linked, but also algorithms and code that you use to link them um, so that we can, people can compare how they're doing data linkages and understand what the, process, what the implications of different strategies are. It also, unlike most of the um, 
data sets at ICPS are the deposits, we actually allow people who are participating in the linkage library to comment on what each, what each other have done. So there's a conversation is being encouraged across what is a very siloed um, disciplinary community. So you have data scientists and computer scientists and statisticians and epidemiologists and social scientists, and they're taking very different approaches. Okay. Data privacy. Obviously, data privacy is a very big deal. I'm going to skip that slide. Um, uh, there are uh, a lot of concerns that data that we have previously made public that we thought we had anonymized actually can be re-identified. Um, things be and given the um, given both the amount of data that's out there in the world and the cheap computational power that you have on your laptop, it actually turns out that things that we thought were safe might not be. This is creating all kinds of um, challenges for the, for the research community and the data community. Things like the Census Bureau is now saying, oh, we don't think we can give you things that we've given you for decades because maybe they're not safe. Um, uh, and they're talking about new, new methods for confidentiality protection. The new methods, the old methods that they used were things like they suppressed data, they swapped households, um, they, uh, um, they aggregated things, right? So they're saying instead of that, what we're going to do is infuse statistical noise into what we're doing, right? Now, They'll, in some ways, this is actually more transparent because census never really tells you very much about what they're doing when they're swapping households, right, um, or swapping, you know, geography. They don't tell you about this. They will. They have promised uh, that they will tell us what they're doing in terms of what the, the statistical function is that they're using to infuse noise, right? But, we, but there are still a lot of very important questions, like how much noise, right? I mean, a broken clock is, you know, is correct twice a day. If we infuse enough noise in it, then we'll be right twice a day, even if it's completely useless data. So, we, so if it's too much noise, it, um, it undermines the use case. So we need to talk about how much noise is consistent with use cases. We also have to talk about who gets hidden and what relationships get obscured. The whole point of confidentiality protection is to make it harder to obscure information about outliers, small groups, people who are not like everybody else, but those are often where we have important information about health, certainly in precision medicine we see this. It's also when we think about health disparities, who's not getting um, measured. Okay. So the, I'm going to, I'm now, I'm going to try and get through this quickly. Um, so we have methods so th uh, for accessing private data. And I'm going to say two things. One is we can, we can fix this. We can, we have solutions that will allow you to transparently and um, access and share confidential and, and analyze confidential data. Right? The solutions are not simply technical. They are also social. Right? The, and um, there are sort of a whole bunch of old arrangements that we've had. That's what I talk about there. There are new things like using virtual data enclaves and, some, and secure online computing that are n solutions that will expand access, um, but they also require not just these sort of computer technical solutions. They require social solutions. We've introduced something called the Researcher Passport, which is a way that researchers can be credentialed to say we are safe researchers in order to access data. And there are a number of organizations like this around the, around the world who are trying to do some things that are similar to say there's some data which anybody can use. There's some data that we sort of have a matrix between um, how much safety and how much expertise the researcher has, the computing environment provides, and the data. So this is a way of getting from all of those. And I'm just, so if you want to apply for a researcher passport, you go to the ICPSR website and you follow these clicks. You go to your My Data account, you click on My Data where it says Researcher Passport, and it takes you to this site where you can watch a lovely video on what the passport is, right? You can apply for the, whoops, you can apply for the passport. Right? It just asks you some information about this. We keep that information confidential, but we can expose it to other data custodians if you want to ask them for permission to access their data. Right? It also keeps track of your training. We're also developing um, 
something which we call uh, StatSnap, which is an online mechanism for analyzing confidential data securely. Um, and then again, rather than telling you, oops, we can't give you results because your sample size is too small, we again infuse noise into it. The last thing, which I'm not really going to tell you about, but that we're building something called SOMAR, which is our social media archive. People are increasingly using social media data to study things like health behaviors, interaction, networks, um, and this data is hard to get. It is impossible to reproduce because it changes every single second, and people just this morning, I think somebody produced a tweet and then took it back because it turned out it was not appropriate. Um, it was on the front page of the newspaper. You can look. Uh, <laughs> um, um, so SOMAR is designed to create a place, again, for researchers to share um, social media data for research purposes. Again, it is much larger, and it has a different structure than the data sets that people are used to working with. So we're trying to provide tools to facilitate this kind of research for people who are not necessarily computer scientists. Right? I do this stuff, and I just let the computer science graduate students do it all. But we have people who are now building this so that we don't not that we shouldn't, I love computer science graduate students, it's great to work with them, but we don't, we, did, we want to be able to um, do this at scale, allowing people who have the domain knowledge to use this data. So we're doing that. So we're talking about building models of access to data. These require trusted intermediaries like ICPSR and a number, and there are lots of other organizations that similarly provide um, and sustain access to data. You need credentialed researchers. You need privacy protecting technologies. You also need cooperation from data custodians. There is some legislation that has been recently passed to help with this at the federal level. The private sector is a much bigger challenge. Again, I've talked about how templates and standards can help with this. It, and actually, and I think actually, um, this was Atul's point when he said, when we do this for a business purpose, it happens much faster. If we can do this in a way that credibly reduces the burden on business information systems, they are much more likely to cooperate with us in making research data available. So that's the goal. All right, so our lessons, to, right? Um, first of all, be not afraid. You can do this, right? Be creative in your use of data. There's an amazing amount of stuff out there that will really help us do better research. And do the right thing, right? Be ethical in your use of data. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. It means that you want to think about how to do this in a way that is responsible. And then finally, sharing is caring. Okay, thank you all very much.